uh, academia, we see an increased interest in, in the sustainable development goals, and many of the work that we build on is of starts at universities and research institutions. Without the numbers, without the data, where can we go and, and say whether we are succeeding or not? So that's really important. And this is why UN Academic Impact, which I think this week hit 1,600 members, uh, is an important initiative for us to really put the science behind what we need to do and create the connections. You mentioned my work with football for the football and soccer, as in America they call it soccer. I don't know why. <laughs> but we took an opportunity last year with the World Cup and the interest in football and said football is about the goals and SDGs are about the goals. So football can also be goal for these goals. We launched it in, uh, a year ago, on the 6th of July, with UEFA as the original first member. And two days ago, we had the, last week, we had a convening for the first uh, year. We already have 220 members in Football for the Goals. That includes the five confederations, international confederations of football, 29 federations, regional, and uh, 27 leagues, uh, 73 clubs, and, and other NGOs and foundations. And they are all committed to become a member of Football for the Goals. You have to commit to sustainability to commit to promoting and implementing the SDGs, to commit to equality. In football, I think they have to do a lot in gender equality. <laughs> Commitment to uh, fighting racism and a human rights-based approach, and also climate action. So those commitments are voluntary, of course. We don't have the mechanism to, at the, at yet to follow up on the issue of accountability. But we are expecting them to start reporting on that. The creative industry, uh, advertising, I mean, they launched a campaign in 2016 called Common Ground. They, the big six global agencies at the time came to Ban Ki-moon and said, we hate each other, we never talk to each other, we compete with each other, but we're coming and we're having creating common ground to support the UN with the SDGs. So a group of them came up and they started each putting together a campaign to help pro bono UN women on, on gender, uh, UNFCC on climate, etc. etc. It was a bit very laudable, but in my view, not enough. When I engaged with them and I said, Thank you very much, but you know, to be sincere, what about SDG 12? Responsible production and consumption. You are part of the problem, you're not part of the solution. As an industry, you continue to work for fossil fuel companies. When are you going to walk the talk? So these are the kinds of things that we, we actually want to put the hard questions to them. So in, in the work that we do in the department, yes, of course, as a department, we, we try to create transparency about what happens in the building. So all the meetings are webcast, we produce press releases, we have a press board here, we facilitate all of that. At the same time, we recognize that the media and member states are not going to be able to achieve the SDGs if they are on their own. So how do we also bring in civil society? How do we bring in academia? How do we bring in football, sports, private sector? I think multi-stakeholder is where we are today. And the report definitely paints a grim picture that, that, that was launched on the 10th of July, two days ago, by DESA. But rather than take a dim view, going back to my football analogy, no football game was ever won in the first half. <laughs> you always win in the second half. <laughs> so there's an SDG summit in September, and it is that the SDG summit is the time when the coach is going to come and talk to the players and saying, okay, this is how we need to do it, guys. This is time to really tighten the screws, go ahead and build on the successes and avoid the mistakes. So we, I'm, I'm hopeful, yes, will we be there 100% in 2030? I hope so, but I'm, I know that I'm a realist also. And I think what we're attempting to do strategically is to think about, you know, how can we re-envision the role of education within the sustainable development movement with an interest in how do we know um, in diversity and in inclusion and I think one of the things we heard very loud and clear at last year in September 
at um, the, the Transforming Education Summit was the Youth Declaration. And the Youth Declaration, really, the top line there was we need to decolonize education because we need more access to that education, to that knowledge. But we also need to take a look at how are we producing that knowledge? Who is producing that knowledge? So I think knowledge production is something that we really need to take you know, a very strong lens and look at in terms of getting at the transformation that is deeply at the heart of the 2030 agenda. And education, of course, has been recognized many times by the UNGA as a key enabler in order to achieve all the rest of those global goals. And so I think I would just strongly suggest, again, that higher education has a very critical and unique role to play in this um, decolonization of education and how we're actually delivering and meeting students where they are at and what their needs are. And I think it also is important to just take a moment to recognize as we're talking about how higher education is going to be working more um, in alignment with the SDGs to recognize that the SDGs themselves are integrated, right? You can't achieve one um, and think that the other areas are also going to make progress, right? It's an integrated um, proposition, value proposition. If we don't get gender equality, then we're not going to be able to make progress in other areas. And so that integration of the SDGs, I think, is really important as we're thinking about the way that we're delivering education in this day and age as well. There's many other threats, I think, as well. We've been talking a lot inside the UN about some of the um, positives and some of the upsides of things such as artificial intelligence and the digital transformation. And I think this is another area that, as educators, we need to really we need to really look at in higher education. So the last thing that I will just reflect on before I pass the floor to Omar is that as we're thinking about this transformative agenda, which is the 2030 agenda, it's also a transformation that we have to make in our own minds, right? It's it's a proposition that transformation requires us to change behaviors uh, in ourselves but also culturally and across the ways that we're delivering education but it's it's a transformation that um, requires us to all look at our own behavior as well and so I think as we're having this conversation today I would just propose this question to you which is what kind of transformation are we educating for in our work together. So um, the last thing that I'll just, uh, I'll just say is the Secretary General has, has mentioned how important higher education is, and I would like to leave you with this quote from him. We count on the leadership of universities and educational institutions to partner with the United Nations and other multilateral institutions, governments at the local and national levels, and representatives of civil society to contribute to enlightened and evidence-based solutions to the world's problems. We call on universities through your teaching, research, and innovation to continue to make a profound contribution to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And the United Nations looks forward to continuing our partnership with universities from all corners of the world. So I really thank Jan once again for, for bringing us together in this endeavor. So, so uh, the UN Academic Impact uh, was born and was created by former Secretary General uh, Dan Ki Moon. And in principle, we are um, an initiative. We are not created by a resolution of the General Assembly. Rather, it was a decision taken by the Secretary and the Secretary General of the UN to engage uh, institutions of higher education uh, around the world with the United Nations. And the idea is that we are going to use the intellectual potential. We are going to use the resources of these institutions to help us achieve the principles 
uh, purposes as enshrined in the UN uh, Charter. And our affiliation is at the institutional level, so we do not uh, accept individual membership in contact with other uh, leagues, associations, or the like. Uh, but through this institutional affiliation, we have access to millions of people. And as of now, as my colleagues already mentioned last week, this is brand new. We achieved the milestone of 1,600 member institutions in specifically 152 countries. Um, and uh, we collaborate, of course, with colleagues around the, uh, the world, and uh, including, for, for sure, within the UN system whenever they would like to connect with academia for various purposes. And we also have a system currently on the review of universities and colleges serving as hubs for both the principles of UNAI that are founding principles of the initiative and, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and I mentioned this, these principles of UNAI, and these principles were born with the initiative itself. And they tell the reality of how universities serve to a larger purpose. Um, all universities and colleges, whenever they assume uh, <coughs> this uh, role or this responsibility of being part of UNAI, they commit themselves to fulfill these principles that you see um, on, on the power deck, on the PowerPoint deck. Uh, and basically, it's about having, as Jashu was mentioning, a transformative view or approach of what higher education is, or what higher education should be. And as you can see uh, towards the end of that, sustainability is one of the core principles of UNAI. Um, UNAI, of course, predates the Sustainable Development Goals by five years at least. But sustainability is the overall umbrella uh, that serves um, to, for the actions that we're currently undertaking concerning the SDGs. And we believe that higher education should be a vehicle to foster, advocate, promote, implement sustainability in practice. The SDGs will, which is the decade of action for the SDGs. That was proclaimed by the State Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, with the understanding that the time to theorize about the SDGs, to examine or review the feasibility of the SDGs, or the relevance of the SDGs, that time has passed, it's behind us. But the time now <laughs> is not to talk about, but to do something about it. Um, to, to implement actions in practice. Um, with that in mind, we have developed certain projects uh, connected with the SDGs, the first of which is the SDGs workshops uh, that we have done in English, French, Spanish, and Chinese. And we have, done, we have done 10 of those. The latest one happened a couple of weeks ago, actually, to mark World Refugee Day, and this was a co-hosted event between us and UNSCR to see how the protection and inclusion of refugees can take place within the framework of sustainable development. And of course, with the inclusion of universities, which is our main audience. We also developed, and this is rather new, this is started in January this year. Uh, we have developed a program called the SDGs Training. Uh, again, the SDGs are very well established in many universities, but some others have approached to us, our faculty does not know anything about the SDGs. And they found, and this is actually very interesting, not only they find that they are already doing many things about the SDGs without knowing it necessarily, but also because these trainings are tailor-made in contrast with the workshops, which are public events, these are tailored and are private events, so to speak, um, and they attract- and free. I'm sorry? And free. And free. Mm -hmm. uh, so they attract faculty and staff from different components of the university that they have never met in their entire lives and they met because of that training, and they said, oh, we can work together on that. And this is particularly true when it comes to large universities, and I always use the example, not where I used to teach, but where, where I used to study, is the main university of my country, and I never met a single person outside of the School of International Studies, ever. Mm. Uh, we are a university of 85,000 students. I never met in my whole life, so except professors <laughs> of French, from modern languages school, but the rest. So these large universities, people are simply not connected. So they are they are connecting uh, among themselves through these trainings. And this is the ABC of sustainable development, the SDGs, what they can do about it, how they can implement, how can they review what their actions are. We have done those in English and Spanish, and as I said here, from January until now, we have had 21 training sessions for equal number of universities in 16 countries, with participation rate of over 600 people. We're currently also developing an SDGs toolkit, which is basically a repository of best practices and ideas. And we made a call for inputs that already closed earlier this year. And we received a big number of uh, 
significant number of contributions, so we're currently reviewing that with the expectation to publish the first draft, hopefully coinciding with the SDG Summit in September. Initially, this will be in English and then translated. We talk over and over again about the SDGs, and many people do not realize that academia is actually expressly referred to in the 2030 Agenda itself. There, is a spe there are two specific references to academia there, and it's, it's very important to see, particularly the first one, that says the governments, of course, the main stakeholders for the implementation of the SDGs, are going to work closely on implementation. So it's not about teaching about it, it's not about creating awareness about it, which of course is important, but they are going to work closely on implementing the SDGs with a number of stakeholders, including academia. Uh, and then, what do we think are the key actions of universities concerning the SDGs? First and foremost, you cannot preach others without changing the way you operate on campus. So the first thing is that you have to implement sustainability policies on campus. You cannot teach about what you don't do. And to my was mentioning what, hap what, what happens in this building. In this building, you will rarely see anything plastic. So we cannot teach others about it if we don't do that in-house. But you need to, I was mentioning that, create awareness to the general public because they have a high level of confidence and legitimacy to do that. Thank you. They also educate, which is pretty obvious considering we're talking about higher education, but also provide training to stakeholders. I remember I'm, I'm a quote-unquote expert on human rights. I, I trained hundreds of judges, attorneys, counselors, police officers, military personnel, and so on. And I know for a fact how universities do that on a regular basis on sustainability issues. Very importantly, they collect data, conduct research, analyze information. In many cases, they even draft legislation that has been passed at the, at the local, uh, regional, subnational, or national level. They provide policy advice, and this is particularly true in the Global North. They engage with the community, and as our DHGs mentioned, they incubate solutions and ideas. And what I really feel is that oftentimes, particularly in higher education, in medical education, we look too much into the um, current um, values of the Western world, right? So, so science, research, the way how we look at technology is, is somewhat um, a goal for them to, to make a carbon copy of the United States or from the UK or from Europe. Um, and that might not be really fitting with their society. And I think that's, that's great that this conference that you plan is in a different cultural environment, mm -hmm. so you really learn from each other. Oftentimes, these meetings, conferences are held in high-income countries uh, for whatever reasons, but I think um, it is time to, to, to reverse that. We can learn mm -hmm. probably a lot more from those countries, because these are, as you said, they're, they're the future. We shouldn't make a society built on our values. The future is in a different culture. Say so what uh, the German Academic Exchange Service, how we are involved, how we are related to SDGs, so one of the main uh, fields uh, we are active in are the so-called SDG partnerships. Uh, maybe you're, you're aware of them, financed by the German um, Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and uh, Development. Uh, DED is able to support now 19 university projects with international partners by German universities with, together with partners from all over the world, many of them in Africa. Uh, that are um, not about talking, but about implementing SDGs. And so we're cooperating, and we're able to support German universities who are cooperating with their partners worldwide on implementing SDGs. So we are really grateful to have this opportunity today to talk to you, because we will, of course, after today's meeting, I will uh, reconnect with our colleagues at the, the headquarters, tell them that we met, and uh, forward a message how uh, we understand from your talk today how important higher education, uh, uh, how important the role of higher education uh, with SDGs is. Um, I would uh, like to also comment on um, on uh, a few things that were said now, and uh, in particular, I I was grateful to hear about the aspects of critical thinking, human rights, multilateralism that you brought up. Um, and uh, of course now, uh, Professor Wu from uh, Columbia University, you also pointed out that there is a question of values. Aren't uh, the values we're uh, working on, or the 
values our work is based on, are they maybe uh, too, um, too, too westernized or too, uh, from, from coming from our perspective. Um, however, uh, I would also say um, that uh, we have to be realistic when we talk about academia and about <laughs> institutions. Uh, you mentioned that they are under a lot of pressure. Scientists, students are under a lot of pressure, and in our worldwide partnerships, we see that. Just to refer to the uh, Russia's war of aggression on Ukraine, uh, as you are aware of, uh, a number, of, uh, actually the majority of uh, Russian universities uh, signed a document in support of this war, and this this caused a lot of trouble for our German universities and for other universities who have partnerships with these really about the ways that our university partners can work together to create a network and to be able to work in a way that benefits at-risk scholars. So all three of my institutions work <coughs> together, but we'd like to now work with our partner institutions in North America and we'd love to see what UNAI might be able to add to that conversation and how we might be able to share our resources and build a wider network. So that's one of the things that I'd like to highlight. Uh,